Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Normal functioning of the government and of parliament is back because an election has taken place, a new government is in. This is the monsoon session masquerading as the budget session or maybe you can call it the budget session masquerading as the monsoon session. That's what started today and on day one, as would happen on the usual budget session, the finance minister placed on the floor of the house economic survey of the year. Now, economic survey is a very important document. It gives us data at a time when data is so difficult to find. In fact, if anything, over the past 10 years, that has declined. Generally, in the Indian political and economic debate, it's the availability of data. And top, topping that, that denial of data is, is the is the non-holding of the census, which would have taken place in 2021, hasn't taken place yet. We have no discussion yet on when this one might be held. The fact is that our decennial census has taken place every decade, like 1881, 1891, so on, with only one exception, 1941. And there was a reasonable excuse then because the world war was at war. This was the World War II period. Otherwise, we've always held a census. 2021 has not been held. That's why all data becomes invaluable. And that's even more the reason we need to read this economic survey more carefully and also keep it with us. So we'll share a link with you uh, with the description. Of course, it's a government document placed on the floor of parliament today. So you can check it out as and when you want it. Now, what does the survey say? As I told you, it's 500 plus pages. It was presented only a few hours earlier. It will keep yielding. It's one of those one of those trees that will keep on giving fruit over the next several days because there is data and there is information. That will be done by my colleagues, our reporters in the course of time. However, I'm picking up a few highlights today from a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that the Chief Economic Advisor V. Anantana Geshwaran did for the media, he has picked up this data and these details and highlights from the survey. I've done a cursory reading of some aspects of the survey and there are some highlights on which we will talk and that is when I will have TCA Sharad Raghavan, our editor for economics, join in with me, particularly the highlights where the survey says some fairly interesting, important and in some cases dire things about one, the contribution of the private sector to, to investment and to growth and to job creation and the economy, and also some concerns about the state of the markets, about the state of the markets. Authors of the survey thing have run, run up ahead of reality that India's stock market valuation, market cap valuation today is far too big. It's even bigger than it tends to be in the more developed economies. So those are issues that we'll talk about once Shara joins in. So I will first of all give you very quickly some highlights. So first, the survey says that growth rates are steady, but this year's growth rate, the survey actually gives you a more conservative estimate, 6.5% to 7%. Now, Chief Economic Advisor said there is a reason. I rather are on the side of caution because ultimately all growth estimates are now to be wrong. So I'd rather be cautious. He, however, gives us this other graphic, see this, that tells us that so many international agencies, even the World Bank, estimate that the growth will be a little bit higher, 7% or a little bit, wee bit above 7%. He said, the CEA in the survey has said between 6.5 and 7. One of the things he's worried about is the quality of monsoon so far, which hasn't lived up to its promise. So that's one. Second, there is an overall increase in industrial output. Industrial output has gone up over the past three years. It had gone up to 12.2 12 in 2022, then came down to 2.1%. That's growth. Now it's up, up again to 9.5%. That is, that's a good thing. Then progress of PLI, that is productivity linked incentives on which some of you might remember, I have expressed my editorial doubts. However, 
the survey claims that this has worked very well this is progressing very well this has produced 8.5 lakh jobs additional jobs which if it's true is fantastic it has produced exports of 4 lakh crores and and products and sales worth 10.8 lakh crores so if you see, read this then you get the indication that maybe government is going to put more money into pli going ahead then an interesting thing which i find which i find very good which is that india's logistics performance and see this graphic all these graphics are from the chief economic advisors powerpoint presentation logistics performance on the world bank rankings india has gone from 44 44 to 38 that's improvement because as you go up it becomes tougher to move up among the highlights from my point of view is the is the reduction in the time taken at a toll plaza it has come down from 734 seconds in 2014 734 seconds by the way is more than 12 minutes from that it has now come down to 47 seconds there are improvements elsewhere turnaround of a container ship etc etc that you can see on the graphic but that, that is a real improvement and that is something that you also hear about very often that's an important thing Next, there is a decline in the external debt to GDP ratio. Now, external debt to GDP ratio, when you see this graphic, immediately it might confuse you because you see this bar growing up. So, the amount that India holds in external debt is going up. At the same time, India's GDP is also rising. So, it is going up, but, not, but in proportion to the rise in India's GDP, it's declining so if you see generally generally in 2015 it was about 25 percent of the gdp that's the worm on this graphic it was about 25 percent of gdp 2024 it is projected to be about 19 percent of the gdp that's an important and interesting point then a good claim and a sub substantiated claim because the data is all there that of all the major economies in particularly in the emerging world not a dollar economy in most of the other prominent economies see this listing india has seen the least exchange rate volatility less exchange rate volatility is good for everybody because people can plan people have less insecurity and people also then feel less constrained to take their money out searching for a safe haven away from away from a volatile currency system next there is a there is complement for a deep a deepening financial system but there will be there will be caveats that we'll come talk about once sharad joins in with me inflation has been under control excellent that's a good point quality of union government expenditure is improved see, see this graphic that's a very important graphic take a few seconds looking at that graphic what do we mean by quality of union government expenditure basically if the government is building deficit then where is that deficit coming from? If deficit is coming more from revenue, revenue deficit, that means that's deficit, deficit from government expenses, salaries, other giveaways, stuff like that, right? But if the deficit is coming from capital outlays, that means that def deficit is coming from well-employed, constructively employed money. And that is what has gone up over the years. If you see it at the beginning of this graphic, the contribution of capital outlay to fiscal deficit was 43%. Now it's come to 47.6%. You see how it works. Go to 21, 2021. That is when you have the lockdown and the first phase of pandemic effect. That is when your deficit from revenue has gone up to 79.7% and capital outlay is just 17.4%. That helps us understand what we mean by quality of government's expenditure which we see through the prism of quality of government's fiscal deficit then there is a sizable section on agriculture now this is also interesting i was also particularly curious because this morning i also read a new article in the economist of which i'm sharing a link with you you can see you can also see the front page the top page on your screens that says that there is one country in the world which can become a food superpower that country is ours, that country is India, but then it has to do the following, right? One, two, three, four, five. The survey also suggests some of the same things. And one of those is improving yields in India. In almost every crop, India's yields are less than half of China's yields. 
And that's where big improvements have to come in from research, technology, science, and also consolidation of land holdings because land holdings in India have become very small. So there's one more graphic that tells you how the size of land holdings in India has fallen over time. If you see in this graphic, in 1970-71, the average size of farmland in India of a plot is 2.82 hectares. A hectare is about 2.5 acres, 2.82 hectares. In 15-16, it's come to 1.08 hectares. Now, Farmers who own so little land, they cannot do any mechanization. They do not produce any surpluses, right? And that's why even now, 68.5% of India's farmers, see this graphic, they are ranked to be marginal farmers. That is, they can basically produce enough to have three square meals and have no surplus, right? And that is what India has to change. For that to change, you need land consolidation. And unfortunately, what would have led us in that direction, the farm laws that were passed by Modi government in an undue hurry, those could have taken us in that direction. But those farm laws were dead on arrival because immediately too many farmers, particularly in the agricultural surplus producing states, became suspicious of those laws. So that is one of the key things that is required. The survey also shows something that we've known and something that the State Bank of India's report from which we quoted earlier in an episode of Karta Clutter, that also underlined that growth in agriculture has come from diversified areas, areas of diversification. So if you see the 10-year period between financial year 14 and 23, crops have only grown by 1.9%, livestock by 7.4%. I presume it means livestock and poultry 7.4%. Forestry and logging 3.9%, fishing and aquaculture 8.95%. Crops are just 1.9%. So that gives you an idea of where farmers should be going, or farmers who are entrepreneurial or who can afford it, and also where government should be applying incentives and policy, policy nudges and policy changes. On industry, the survey makes a very important point on, de on deregulation of land and labor laws. Now, labor laws. I will not go into too much detail, but one highlight, interesting highlight is how so many states restrict women. And that is not good for India. So the survey says that 10 of India's most popular states, see this graphic, 10 of India's most popular, popular states amongst themselves have 139 restrictions on women going out to work. In fact, many of these states also restrict women from working at night. These are really outdated regulations and they make even less sense in a country which has to produce at least 80 lakh jobs per year till 2036 because that's the rate at which the population will grow and even as the population growth moderates, that's the rate at which agriculture will shed jobs. So people will need to move from agriculture to other jobs. For that to happen, some of these laws have to change, but also land use laws have to change. The survey, for example, tells you that if you see floor area ratio, that is the amount of land that you can use for an industry, it is the lowest in India among major economies. In India, it's just about one floor area ratio. The states that do very well in India, Haryana, Haryana is a very good example, the survey tells us, is 1.5, which is a good example for India, but also there are restrictions about how many parking spaces you need in a factory of any given size. So if you see a factory of, say, 10,000 square meters, right, how many parking spaces do you need? In, in Singapore, you need 24. In Hong Kong, you need 15. In Gujarat? you need 109. And in Odisha, which actually has a better flow area ratio than even Haryana of 2, it's 196. It's completely unnecessary. Maybe it also comes from the belief that we don't have so much public transport. But these are really archaic laws because if you spare so much land for setbacks, for open spaces, right, and then restrictions on going higher, then you need that much more space per worker. Some of those comparisons are also given. So please see this graphic. In India, you need per worker space of 3.38 square kilometers. In Singapore, it's 2.88. In the holiest of the holy, Switzerland, it is 2.86. And Malaysia, with which we, we are now competing for manufacturing that shifting out of China, that should shift out of China, is 2.86. 
six five in Germany and Norway there are no restrictions. They just say sufficient space, and that's where India has to get its act together and make these changes. Floor area ratio. I told you most of India is one or less than ten. Uttar Pradesh, for example, is zero zero point eight. So Yogi Adityanath has the power to change that. I'm surprised he hasn't yet changed it. Uh, Haryana 1.5 among industrializing states, at least parts of Haryana are industrializing. But compared to this, Singapore is 4. Hong Kong goes from 2.5 to 12. What this also does is that because you have such restrictions on the use of land, it increases the cost of running an industry because land then becomes that much of a cost. These are some of the highlights from this economic survey. Once again, please read this carefully. We will share with you both, one, the economic survey, the entire document, and then also the PowerPoint presentation that the chief economic advisor put out. Both are at your service now. You can read that. Meanwhile, I call in Sharad Raghavan to explain some of the key highlights that he's picked up, he's identified in this survey for us. So, Sharad, it's a busy day and week for you. Uh, now, among the highlights of the economic survey, uh, I've been seeing your stories also. As I noticed, you picked up three things. One, uh, there is quite a bit of criticism of the private sector, or quite Absolutely. a bit of concern about the private sector, uh, including of the quote-unquote fact that private sector is not investing. And that's something that we've said before, you've said this in your stories also, that private investment has dried up, private sector has not been investing, although the profits have gone up, particularly after the tax breaks right. that this government gave. The second thing is, there is concern that stock markets valuations have run up too far and they are now a much larger percentage of our GDP, more than way more than 100% of our GDP, Absolutely. which is uh, sort of unreal for a developing economy. Uh, survey specifically says higher than other emerging markets like Brazil and China. So I'm touched that we still call China an emerging <laughs> market, right? The Chinese, I'm sure, are flattered, right? Uh, that's a joke. Uh, and the third thing is financialization. Financializ financialization of the economy. I don't understand what financialization is. So we'll need you to explain it. And also the co concern about derivatives. So tell us first about the private sector. So on the private sector, there are actually four major concerns. One, it lays the onus of job creation almost entirely on the private sector and to some extent the state governments. But on the private sector, it says that while between FY20 and FY23, their profits have grown by 4x, that is they've quadrupled. It says that compensation and hiring growth, and in the words of the so, uh, survey, it says hardly kept up. It doesn't go into data, but it basically is pointing out that it has not really kept so up. So what this with... means is they haven't hired enough people to justify, I mean, if you are making these mega profits, they must invest. Investing means hire more people. Right. And they are not giving people enough raises. Enough raises, right? yes. Wrong time to bring up at the time of our <laughs> appraisals, right? Yes, absolutely. And the next thing is that uh, they're questioning how the private sector has been investing its money. So they do acknowledge that after FY22, gross fixed capital formation, which is their investments and assets, has picked up. But they're pointing out that the bulk of this is in things like dwellings and other buildings Whereas they're not investing as much in machinery or equipment or intellectual property, which is what will drive growth. So it calls this, it says that this is not a healthy mix. Now, the third thing is perhaps to me the most interesting because it pulls up the private sector for driving in India, the use of social media, the use of, you know, a lot of screen time and the proliferation of unhealthy food habits. It says that the private sector's role is both substantial and myopic. So this to me is, is very funny because it's also pointing out that the, first of all, it's saying that this is the private sector's fault and not pointing out the fault of the people consuming any of this. But it also says that India has a traditional lifestyle, examples from our history, traditional lifestyle and recipes which have shown us how to live in harmony with nature. And so the private sector would do well to learn from this. There's also a very strong plug for vegetarianism, by the oh, way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because it says that uh, to produce 1,000 calories from meat, you have to burn, create so much CO2 and need so much land. However, I don't know 
who calculates calories out of meat I, absolutely yes you, you don't eat meat for calories. for calories that said anyway that debate can go on um, the precise point that you made about companies spending uh, investing complete investments going on not the right areas the precise figure that the survey gives us is that only in the past four years only 35 percent increase has taken place in investments on machinery and equipment and 105 percent on dwelling dwellings buildings and structures and this is 35 percent cumulatively so you right. can see on a year right. to year no, basis yes. it'd yes. be so little yeah. i mean 105 percent is also cumulative right. that is char sal mein if somebody had 100 crore but somebody spent 100 crores on building dwelling dwellings and factory premises and stuff the same company spent only 35 crores on plants and machinery is that right to say right that's yes. right to say all right carry on now the next area where they have pulled up the this is the private financial sector where they've said that there's a lot of mis-selling that's happening in the banking sector and the insurance sector and they say that you know the this excuse that no this is happening by just a few individuals in a few institutions this doesn't hold water because the rampant way that it's happening shows that it's more an industry factor that's happening so this is an area of concern they've raised this they've said that this is short termism because you are dissuading people in the long term to from investing in these areas you're going to scare them away so just looking for a quick profit you're hurting your customers which is not the way forward so that seems to be a nudge uh, an indirect nudge to sebi and rbi absolutely right uh, are the we, regulators are we right to re read it as that i absolutely think so there are there are actually in fact various ways in which they are pointing out uh, concerns in the financial sector that sebi more than rbi but also rbi needs to take note of the next one as you had mentioned is to do with the stock markets and the derivatives and how the absolute and, and futures and options and futures and options which uh, is a part of the derivatives, derivatives market the growth in this area has been tremendous so just to give you a few stats from the economic survey it says that so in fy23 there were 11.4 crore dmat accounts which and a dmat account is necessary for you to invest in the stock market or the der derivatives or market. to trade or to trade this jumped to 15.5 around that much in one year by the end of fy24 so this is one indication of how much the retail participation in the market has grown the grow the market capitalization they said in fy19 was about 77 percent of gdp which by fy24 reached 124 percent of gdp and there's a story that I've done, which I appeared last week, where currently it's at 140% of GDP. And now it's pointing out that this in a developing economy is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of instability. Fragility. And fragility. fragility. And this is concerning because they say that especially with such a high retail participation in derivatives, if at all there is a stock market crash, it's these investors in derivatives who are going to get hurt a lot more. And if they get hurt, history has shown us that they don't come back to the market for a long time, which not only hurts them because the market is a legitimate way for you to grow your savings, to grow your investments, but it also hurts the economy. And the reason I called it dire was that the economic survey takes you back, brings back uh, the Asian financial crisis yes. of 1997-98 and also the global financial crisis of 2008. Absolutely. Those are the two examples it gives, which are quite scary. These things are only done to scare people and that seems to be the idea. Even if not to scare them, then to sober them down a little bit. Now, what is financialization? Because that is something that I began to read in the financial press a little bit, uh, in the serious financial press, but I also see that coming out of the survey. So largely financialization, it refers to the growing clout of the financial markets, the institutions in this, the financial sector, and also the financial elite, which are the hedge fund managers and uh, their like who operate in this area. It's the growing influence that these people have, growing influence power that they have over economic policy. 
that is what financialization means and the economic survey also does say that financialization has not ended well even in developed countries and that's where these examples of the global financial crisis and the Asian crisis come up. So it's kind of warning us that this is happening in India and we should be careful, we should watch out. So is the government getting worried about this? Is that what the survey telling tells us? So in the government we've had indications apart from in the survey, the RBI has said it in their latest financial stability report. They've talked about the rising retail participation and how again, if there's a market crash, it could really hurt, especially when markets are overvalued. And the SEBI chairperson, uh, Madhavi Puri Butch, she has also talked about this in a press conference recently after their board meeting, where she's saying that, is it the right thing that people are using their savings for speculation rather than investing them in growth areas. So there is and there are indications already, the various stories in the media that are talking about SEBI coming up with norms where they're going to try to restrict the kind of FNO trading that is happening right now, which is tremendous. If you look at the numbers, the growth has been very, very sharp. So they are trying to clamp down on it. And this, of course, gives us an indication. Maybe even in the budget tomorrow, there might be something if they try to tax it more, you, you'll see that in the budget. But overall, you'll see some indications over the next few weeks. So some things, uh, some things been buzzing because today there was a story in the Financial Times on this. Right. At how so many Indians, uh, ordinary Indians are now trading mm -hmm. futures and options. Uh, I think a month and a half back, The Economist had it on right. how some hedge funds are making billions of dollars as a lot of, as millions of Indian households lose small amounts of money. Right. Uh, and also in the survey itself, let's talk about, it, it doesn't use the word exotic products, but it does say uh, when you take leverage and yes. invest, which means when you borrow and invest, it increases the risk. Absolutely, because I mean, if you lose your investments then, then you not only have lost your money, but you've lost, the bank has lost its loan. You can't repay the bank. So it, there's a carry-on, knock-on effect. So thank you, Sharad. This was, the, this was a quick sharp take on, on, on the economic survey, which has lots of interesting highlights. However, I know you talked about the survey blaming the private sector, basically blaming the private sector, not only of not investing enough, but also investing in the wrong area. So okay. the lines that catch my attention, and I really think these are remarkable lines. It says social media, screen time, sedentary habits, unhealthy food, make a lethal mix. And I go on to quote from the survey, the private sector's contribution to this toxic mix of habits is substantial and that is myopic. And then it preaches about traditional lifestyles and also it's almost like a grandparent talking huh? Absolutely. or maybe may, maybe a boarding house warden talking, <laughs> right? I mean, and I know, I know how seriously anybody takes them. On that super serious note, we conclude this discussion on the economic survey for the year and now we wait for the budget. Thank you, Sharad.